not all your stuff has to come inside the tent. When you've gone to the extra measure of attaching your rain fly, you get the added advantage of, of a gear vestibule like this one here on this Boulder 33. This is a portion of the rain fly that extends past the poles and that is staked into the ground where you can store your gear. Uh, maybe your boots, maybe a small pack, some clothing items, maybe your dog. Allie's looking at me now. She usually comes inside the tent, especially when it's cold. It's a great addition. I like about a 10 square foot or larger gear vestibule if I have a choice. Again, that's going to mean a little extra weight, but I'm opting for the firepower side of the equation. Uh, other ones are a little bit smaller. Some are a bit bigger. I have an outstanding tent called the Kelty Snowfall that's not shown here that I've had for over 15 years. It has a huge vestibule on it uh, that's basically hooped and is a tent all on its own. That Snowfall's vestibule is uh, 22 square feet. Huge. Yeah, this, uh, I forget what the square footage is on the north face, but the vestibule and the floor area of the tent together add up to 56 square feet on this tent. That's a lot of livability, a lot of storage room for a tent that only weighs 8 pounds. And that... Imagine we've been in a rainstorm for 8 hours and what the ground will be like. For this area under the vestibule to be useful, I need a ground cloth. I'm not putting my clothing, my boots, maybe a pack, maybe my dogness here in the mud. Again, a ground cloth functions nicely and you don't have to buy one, just make your own. This is basically a $7 tarp that I cut out with a razor blade. Ground cloths will aid the longevity of your tent. Pretty much any quality backpack style of tent will use aluminum poles. The reason that's a standard is because they're so lightweight and so strong for their intended use. I would stay away from fiberglass poles. They really have no place in a backpacking style of tent. They're heavy, they're bulky, their ferrules uh, are just a pain in the butt. And if they fail, they're going to fail catastrophically, splinter and break, so you cannot repair them. An aluminum pole might bend and it might break under severe usage, but there are repair kits using sleeves that you can use and actually repair it on site. Very durable. They have some carbon fiber poles out there, but they're extremely expensive, adding a lot of cost to your tent, and they're unnecessary for the weight savings achieved, if you ask me. Most poles are made out of 7,000 series aluminum. Uh, the manufacturer will generally, generally brag about this and tell you how awesome their poles are. Easton is a common brand of poles that they use. Also DAC DAC, I think that stands for the Donga Aluminum Corporation, a manufacturer of aluminum. Both are quality poles that will last and withstand a lot of stresses and bending before they break. And don't be actually alarmed if in some designs your poles do bend when you set the tent up. That's normal. Uh, like in this uh, boundary CD, there is a slight bend to them when I take it down. No big deal. It's designed to do that. The poles can take it. Don't be alarmed. Uh, most of these aluminum poles will be shot corded inside, wearing a strand of shot cord in the middle. Expect that to wear out over time. That Boulder 33 down yonder, its shock cord is already worn out and I need to replace it. And what that shock cord does is just keeps the pole sections together so you don't lose them. And they keep uh, the poles integral to themselves. Most modern tent designs of the backpacking variety are very easy to pitch. If you get a clip only version like this Boundary CD by Sierra Designs, an excellent tent maker, they're extremely easy to pitch you don't have to thread them. All you're doing is popping the clips on to the poles, voila, you're done. Uh, for me, if it's been a while, if I've pitched one of my tents, uh, it may take me a little bit to kind of remember. Uh, most modern tents, especially REIs, uh, will have the instructions slown on, sewn onto their stuff sacks. A great convenience feature, should you forget. Uh, I recommend probably practicing, practicing the pitch of your tent in your backyard before you go out on your expedition. Uh, Murphy's Law will probably prevail, meaning that when you pitch your tent, it's going to be raining or snowing, and you'll need it up in a hurry. So practicing with it, practicing with the, key, the kids is a great idea. 
So while your 7,000 series aluminum poles that comes with that come with your tent will probably last and last, I wouldn't expect the same from the stock tent stakes. They generally will suck pretty bad. Here's an example of those. And this is an example of how they handle such rocky terrain that you're looking at. They will bend, they will noodle on you, and you're going to have to hammer them straight constantly. They just are really low quality. But that's a way that the manufacturer is saving both weight and money in his tent design by putting in uh, cheesy aluminum stakes like that. What I do and what I recommend you do is spend a little extra and separately buy <clears throat> enough tent stakes for your tent along the lines of this North Face one made of 7075 aluminum. Huh, same type as your poles. <clears throat> or maybe the MSR variety. There's several brands out there, but they all follow the same type of plan form. They're angled, they're stronger, sharper, much more capable of penetrating tough soil conditions like this. But even this is tough for a quality stake. And you might have to come up with a different methodology of anchoring your tent down using maybe a boulder system with 550 cord attached where you can really stretch out all the corners of your tent. Um, that's important too. Don't under, uh, you know, discount that. Uh, when you stake a tent properly, not only is it guarded against blowing away with the high winds that you saw here earlier, but also it maximizes the interior volume. It stretches out those walls and so um, you have maximum interior space and you're not rubbing on the side. So spend some time staking your tent out according to the manufacturer's instructions that you will have included and you'll thank yourself when nighttime comes. Nighttime's coming so I'm rushing to get everything done. Still a couple things to talk about. One uh, are convenience features for your tent. Uh, and they get better and better every year and most of them I like one of them is like this the gear loft This is an indispensable part of making your tent more livable. Uh, I always use my gear lofts They'll have my headlamp maybe my Phoenix flashlight maybe with some knives You know, it's a great place to store stuff and have it readily accessible when it's dark out and you don't readily have a light with you. You just reach up, oh yeah, there's my knife or there's my light. Gear lofts, more the better, within reason of course. Also hanging loops for clothing. Here in the Boulder 33 you can see they sewed in several gear loops. You can attach a variety of things to this. Maybe uh, an electric lantern, your Phoenix flashlight hung upside down with that uh, lantern attachment to it, the light cone. It would illuminate the entire tent. Here's another one up here. These are all convenience features that are really nice. Side gear lofts or side gear pockets are also good. Most quality tents will have this. Another great place to store snacks in non-bear country would be right there. Or whatever, you know, medications, Kleenex, your pee bottle. And yes, I recommend a pee bottle in your tent. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have to get out, make a special trip, put your boots on, your you know, shoes on, whatever. Uh, take a pee bottle. It pays off big dividends. Reflective zipper pulls are actually nice to have. This boulder does not have them, but some do, and that's a great way to pick your tent out at night when you're walking in from another location, or when you're just searching for the zipper pulls with a light. Nice to have. A convenience feature on this boulder 33 is they have ways to secure the rolled up tent fly. Not needed, but it's nice as we exit and enter through our vestibule area. Nice to have. Now, a minimalist will say, I don't need all that. And actually, a minimalist probably hasn't made it this far in the videos anyhow. Uh, he probably just went to his local store, bought a tarp, and that's how he's going to sleep, is under a tarp. But I generally don't like plastic windows in the flies of my tents. Uh, I have seen that they craze over time, and they're pretty much non-visible after a period of years. And they add unnecessary weight. They're kind of hokey. I would stay away from them. However, some vents and flies can actually be useful. Again, back to the Boulder 33, you can see that it has two hooded uh, intake vents on the fly. And in my experience, they do work. The idea is that we unzip the portion of the vestibule right here, and wind comes in here and enters the living area of the tent. It's a great design. Uh, you will find over time the reinforcing rib or uh, plastic piece in here will bend as the tent is rolled up and stored 
but it doesn't add a lot of weight and it does add some more ventilation, which is critical to the comfort factor of the tent. This Boulder 33 tent of the Nut and Fancy clan has seen multiple mountain expeditions and yet it looks pretty decent. That's because I do my best to take care of my equipment, especially my tents, my sleeping bags, my sleeping pads. Uh, one way you can do that when you get home is to set your tent up again and let it dry out. Almost always your tent will come home wet. Uh, that's because of condensation, snow, rain, all of that will find its way into the fabric and the best way to do it is just set it up in a dry location at your house, your cabin, your ranch, whatever. Let it dry out and then I use Goo Gone to take the sap off of it. Um, there's generally a lot of sap on it from trees like that. Actually the spruce trees tend to have a lot more of it. And then I'll use Goo Gone uh, with some blue towels, those shop towels, and clean off the tent body too. And that keeps your tent looking good and performing good over the years. And when I store it in the, the stuff sack, I do not just jam it in there. I roll it up. Contrary to what some people have said. Some guys will say, no, you should just jam it in there. And that's the best way to make sure the waterproofing isn't crinkled up and separating from the nylon. Uh, I've never seen that. I just roll them up in half for over 30 years. So it works for me. Great way to take care of it. Also, it's probably a good idea to take with you on your expedition some ripstop nylon tape. Uh, sold in outdoor stores, uh, maybe some department stores have it. It's designed to repair nylon like that. The reason that's a player is because you might have like a fire ember land on your tent like this Gunnison 2 and melt right through the mesh like that. So if I had some ripstop nylon, I could just tape that on there now. You could also use that Gorilla brand duct tape, always good to have with you as well. You could tape that. But if you're on a no kidding expedition far away from everywhere uh, with lots of bugs, kind of like we have here in this environment, then yeah, you probably want to plug that hole up so you don't get bitten or get water in your tent if it's on the tent body. Also speaking to a waterproof design, uh, that is the polyurethane coating on your tent floor. Um, and let's just make it a given, I would avoid any tent floor that's made out of this material. Kind of what I use for my ground cloth, the tarp material. That's going to be a cheesy tent that will not last, it's going to get holes in it. Uh, I don't mind it for my ground cloth because I can easily replace that and it's lighter weight. But for your tent floor, you want a heavy denier nylon that's polyurethane coated. Heavy polyurethane coated. It's your last ditch, uh, last ditch mechanism to prevent water coming through the floor of your tent. And this is again why I use a ground cloth. Because I don't want those sharp rocks coming through and puncturing this polyurethane coating and compromising the integrity of it. Uh, and again, I'll seam seal it as well. Different varying uh, levels of polyurethane coating, I won't get into that. Just look for one that's heavy. They'll brag about it in the specifications of the tent. And uh, it's a, definitely a feature you want to have. Allie's in the background keeping watch as the sun goes down here at this high alpine location. She's really good at that, by the way. Great bear dog. Um, let me talk a little bit about realistic carry weights of the tent varieties. And again, we have a little bit of a representation posted here. This is kind of a small two-man tent like I discussed earlier. I think of it more actually as a large one-man tent. Uh, expect around six pounds for that style of tent to include rain fly, upgraded stakes, sky lines. That North Face 33 that we've been discussing all afternoon, full up with the rain fly, the guy lines, upgraded stakes, the cutout ground cloth, which I showed you, eight and a half pounds. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of a substantial carry weight, especially for one person. But if you break it between those in your party, very doable. Maybe about three pounds a piece, uh, more or less, for each person to haul into a location similar to this one. That Kelty Gunnison down there is an example of a small three season tent. Uh, it has some disadvantages like we kind of touched on. Maybe uh, a, not a super tight pitch with a clip system that Kelty has there. A small rectangular floor plan. But full up with upgraded stakes, a ground cloth, the thing weighs around 6 pounds. Actually a little bit under, 5 pounds, 12 ounces with all the upgrades on it. Uh, so not too bad. And the floor plan on that is 92 inches by 58 inches. 
so it can accommodate some tall sleepers like myself. Maybe not super wide. <clears throat> Expect about six pounds. <clears throat> Incidentally, that Boulder 33, and by way of reference, you guys can remember this, the floor plan on that is 66 inches wide, 95 inches long. And I generally don't like a floor plan shorter than 90 inches, if I did not already say so. Otherwise, you're going to be rubbing the tent walls like we talked about. So, 8.5 pounds, 8 pounds. Realistic carry weight, not pie in the sky carry weight, for a large, quality, well-designed, three-season large tent. What about expedition styles of tents like this ARC-3 represents? Again, this is a discontinued tent, uh, no longer available, at least to be bought new, but it's representative of several North Face designs, maybe some Marmot and other brands. Uh, it represents the expedition style of tent, which has, it kind of opts for ultimate strength and maybe sacrifices something in ventilation and weight in doing so. And anytime you see a tent, incidentally, with a center hoop like this, it's going for strength. Maybe for wind resistance, snow load resistance, and mo most four season tents, which this ARC-3 tent is, will have a center hoop. Again, it gives the added advantage of more interior space, vertical walls, and strength has a disadvantage of more carry weight. Full up, and that's with an outstanding rain fly that includes a 20 square foot vestibule with a hoop on it. Uh, the ground cloth, upgraded stakes, and all the guy lines. The ARC-3 uh, by Walrus weighs, for me, 8.5 pounds. Uh, actually, 8 pounds, let me look at my notes, and 4 ounces. So, not a super lightweight tent, but again, it's a tent that can weather the worst storm, I know, because I've been there and done it, uh, as long as you can put up with its slight downsides, like no mesh for ventilation. That's pretty standard for four-season tents, though, because they're expecting you to pretty much camp in snow. Me, I'll take the ventilation even in snow. Okay, the sun's coming down, so I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, I know I forgot stuff. I'll annotate it on the videos as I remember it. And I really only covered a slim cross-section of backpacking tents. Um, I did have some good representatives out here. You saw the Kelty Gunnison 2, which is a small three-season backpacking tent, affordable, around 150 bucks, maybe less, maybe around 100 if you get it on sale. It's a good tent. Uh, has a few drawbacks, just like most tents do. Uh, the Boulder 33 by the North Face was our poster child for the large three-season tent, one that can accommodate two full-grown males comfortably. Great tent, that is. Then we had the Walrus Arc 3 that represented the expedition style of tent out there and with its increased snow and wind capabilities. And then also another three-season small variety of tent that we use today was the Sierra Designs Boundary CD. Uh, again, all these are, well not all of them, the Gunnison 2 is still available, but most of the other tents are discontinued, but you'll see iterations and variations on the same designs by all the makers under different model names. I may make a separate video about that sometime. Uh, a couple styles of tents that I didn't review. Uh, the A-frame. I'm not a fan of the A-frame tent. It's because of my own bad experiences with it. Yes, I know there's good ones out there, uh, you know, maybe by Eureka. However, they don't maximize interior volume like a good geodesic or variation thereof like this tent does uh, with the vertical sidewalls and the maximum interior space. Also, I didn't cover the hoop style of tent, the European style of hoop tent, because I don't like them. You know, I, I think that a hoop style of tent that's not self-standing, that I have to stake out and keep very taut in order to be weatherproof, and I have used a tent like that before uh, from Slumberjack, I think. It was kind of a bivy style of tent. I didn't dig it. You know, it just, I'm constantly having to unstake it and restake it to maximize tautness. Get a self-standing tent, one that's easy to set up, that's strong, as indicated, use a, uses a good pole and ventilation system like we've discussed and it'll probably last you your lifetime if you take care of it. Uh, and that's the good news. Uh, I can't really promote one manufacturer over another. There's so many good ones out there. You know, Mountain Hardware, MSR, Cabela's, EMS, uh, Sierra Designs, Kelty, The North Face, Marmot, Big Agnes. These are all great tent makers. They all have great products. 
You're just going to have to weigh out in, with your own POU what's going to fit your application best. And also your pricing structure. Here comes big advice from Nothing Fancy. Always buy your tents and actually everything you buy out of season. The best time to buy your tents this year or any given year will be at the end of the backpacking or camping season. And that's when you'll be able to go to various places online and find your best deals. One of the best places I go is campmore.com. You'll see it in annotation there. Great place to go out of season. And it's where I bought several of these tents, actually, uh, for probably half of their retail price. Uh, like I said, I got a smoking deal on this Boulder 33. That Gunnison 2, very affordable. And so guys will say, well, you know, uh, you like expensive gear. Well, no, I like gear that works and that lasts through hard use that I put it through. Uh, it's because I've gone the cheap gear route, and I usually have to rebuy it. You know, it just falls apart on me. Uh, and it's heavier, it's tougher to carry, it's harder to set up, it doesn't have all the features of ventilation, on and on and on. Yeah, I like good gear, and it's worth the extra money. Campmore.com is not the only website you can go to. REIOutlet.com, another good source for your tents. LL Bean, EMS, they'll all have sales at times. You can sign up for those emailed flyers or specials. <clears throat> Just spend some time surfing on the internet and you'll find the gear specials you need. Um, and look in the comment section too. You'll see some experienced users roll in. They'll say, hey, this is a good place to go too. So the exchange information will happen below in the comments. That's always good and I like that as well. So hopefully this series of videos has equipped you with some knowledge of what to look for in your own tent. Again, you need to identify very accurately your POU, how you're going to use a tent and what kind of weight you're willing to carry. Along with that weight will come the argument of firepower versus mobility. Uh, you know, if you want more convenience, features, room, strength, it's going to increase the weight, the carry weight of your tent. If you're a minimalist, then you won't have all the convenience or the room, but you will have a very lightweight tent. Uh, and the, the design features on these tents will change over time. Right now, I'm seeing a lot of integration of mesh in the designs, and that's good. It's going to increase the ventilation, it's going to lighten the carry load, and it's going to make for a generally more comfortable tent in generally temperate, temperate climates. However, along with that mesh, uh, current designs aren't giving you the option to seal it up should you want to get that warmth in your tent uh, at the sacrifice of ventilation. Uh, look close, closely at your floor plan. Again, I like the rectangular floor plans or variations of geodesic designs that are generally rectangular and wide enough to accommodate two adult males sleeping side by side on sleeping pads. Um, so yeah, that's going to maybe add a little extra weight, but a lot more comfort. Good rain fly extending all the way to the ground. Clip setup versus sleeve setup. We've discussed that. You can decide for yourself. Um, you can go to stores like REI or some very high quality outdoor backpacking stores are a good place to look at tent designs. Uh, hopefully they're set up. But I'm seeing less and less of that these days. Uh, generally, when you go to an outdoor store, their tents aren't set up because they can't afford the floor space. Uh, some I even see have like these ridiculous G.I. Joe size tents, and they expect the consumer <laughs> to somehow extrapolate from that G.I. Joe size tent what a real size tent's going to be. It doesn't work. Uh, so you might have to rely on just pictures. Uh, there's lots of good forums you can go to as well in gear buying advice websites, and you can see reviews on these tents. Um, tons of them. I may annotate some of my favorites if I think about it. Um, but it won't cost an arm and a leg to get a backpacking tent that will serve you and your family pretty much the rest of your life if you take care of it. That's all I have to say. Nothing fancy signing off from about 9,000 feet in elevation along with Allie the Mountain Dog. What a beautiful evening this has been. Wind died down, sun's coming down, animal activities picking up. Thanks for tuning in. Sure appreciate it. Uh, again, if I forgot stuff, I'll annotate it. See ya. Thanks for the good ratings and support. Check you soon. Beautiful.
birds coming alive. Forest fire in the background. We'll get the better dudes. See ya.